how the heck are you? I'm good, sir. I'm good. How, right. and how are you? Well, you know, um, if I was if I was doing any better, it'd be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. So, listen. Um, I don't know if you've if you've been able to uh, see any of the shows that I've done thus far on the dialogues. So I'll just tell you that my whole reason, one of my reasons for doing it is, hang on, let me move this around. Let me move stuff around on my screen here. Um, one of my reasons for doing this is because there are so many of us out there in the Jeet Kune Do world with all these different backgrounds, all these different origin stories, but we have this thing that in common. Yes. Yeah. You know, so, so for example, what I, here, here is what, here's, here was my, uh, here was the, the script for my, my planned introduction of you, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. It says, um, uh, it, it says, it says, let's see. Um, my guest today is a guy who has done something that an increasing number of JKD instructors have also achieved, and that is professional success, right? Yes, sir. Uh, so and then it says, I'm always fascinated to hear the stories of those in the JKD clan who have uh, achieved that degree of success because I think that they have certainly bucked the traditional trend in Jeet Kune Do, right? Yes, yes. So, here, so here's where it gets funny. It says, I've known Harley for a number of years, so I'm gonna start by spouting off what I think is right about him and he'll correct what I get wrong, and that's how we'll get the show underway. Okay, that sounds fun. All right, so listen to this. Here's, here's as much as I know. Your Jeet Kune Do journey started in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where you were a protege of the late, great JKD pioneer, Terry Gibson. Yes, that's correct. And that's where you began to acquire your martial art business acumen. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, that's it. That's as much <laughs> <laughs> right so now there's a huge blank right <laughs> sure sure yeah yeah for most sure. of the world really yeah that's exactly right yeah okay so there's a huge blank that we that we now have to to fill in so um before gibson's martial arts was there martial art training or is that where you started no, there was martial arts training. I, you know, uh, I started, you know, as a as a very young teenager, like most people, and and I studied under a couple of uh, back then PKA world champions. Okay. Um, yeah. So you know, training was a lot of calisthenics uh, to get in better shape, and then lots of big sweaty sixteen ounce boxing gloves and sparring. You know, full contact. And um, then I got uh, introduced to a guy named Monty Ashley, who who uh, taught. Uh, an Okinawan Kempo system and a Chinese Gong Fu system. And he had actually studied with Gary Dill. And okay. so, yeah, so I, that, that was kind of my introduction to like, Hey, this is what Jeet Kune Do is. And, um, and so I was already a black belt under him and a couple of different systems that he taught. And then, then I met uh, Mr. Gibson at a Sifu Francis Fong seminar. Okay. In Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so I met them both at the same time. So, Yeah. That's how that ha that's how that started. Yeah, yeah. So so how long were you with Terry Gibson? Can you remember? Uh, well, from 1980, I would say I started really in 1988. Uh, even though that's when I first met him, I didn't move there until 90, 91. Um, but I was on the phone with him. And wait, I was wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Where were you? You weren't in Oklahoma. No, no, I was in Arkansas. I was uh, four, four hours away. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, so, and, you know, I was like everybody else. I was trying to make martial arts schools. I was dirt broke and, uh, you know, just couldn't make things happen. And um, Terry had the martial arts that I was looking for. And so, yeah. uh, and he was kind enough to answer the phone when I would call and, and um, you know, welcome me to their events. And his school had, had really just kind of come into its own at that point, too. So, mm. um so, you know, yeah, that was, I would, I would save up money and go, you know, take two hours worth of private lessons. And then he would let me hang out for the evening and join evening classes. And then I would drive home and then work my butt off for a month on that material and then drive back and 
videotaped right. the private lessons and just did that back and forth until around 90, 91 when he uh, actually, I went up to, I had lost my job and he said, well, just come stay with me and Kathy for a week. And so I stayed in their guest bedroom and uh -huh. we trained all week, private lessons and classes. And at the end of the week, he offered me a job. So that was it. Wow. Yeah. That, that, that's, a gr that's a great story. But see, as you were saying that, like when you talked about saving up money and, and then going back out there, that reminds me of Cass Magda, for example, who did something similar in Canada yeah. until he moved to LA. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And then and then the whole being invited to 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 stay and after after the private lessons and do the group classes. Right. The Fudan does that with people all the time. Yes. Yes. You know? So so I, I just I just think it's so cool and to me it's it's so fascinating that that all of us so called different people have these similar stories or aspects of our stories are so similar, right? Okay, so now he offered you a job. What was your, what was your title? Uh, I was a program director, um, okay. which was really a, kind of a new thing in martial arts business. Right, uh, yeah. Director, nobody really, so, <laughs> so really it was like you do everything that we're not gonna do. So uh, <laughs> you know, I answered the phones, I swept the floor, I taught classes. Uh, he, he, when, when he brought me in, uh, he brought me in. He had a, a ranked curriculum with with colored, uh, I yes. think it's colored shirts at the time instead yeah. of belts. And no, uh, no, it wasn't. You know what it was? It was the ink on the t-shirt that changed color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right? probably Am right. I right. Yeah, probably right. Yeah, I yeah, remember but, that. Yeah. So I, I came in. He made me a red sash, which there were. Uh, three other guys getting ready for for their black belt or their instructor test under him, mm -hmm. and uh, and Mr. Gibson had a real uh, a great formula that I still use today, and that was once you become an instructor under me, I'll recommend you to be apprentice under Guru Dan. Right. But not until you've achieved that goal, and I know who you are and know what kind of character you have. Right. So, um, and that was a, a long term goal of mine. But um, so anyway, I got in there about red sash. Uh, you know, good hard uh, year of testing, uh, training, mm -hmm. and uh, tested with those guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, three of us made it. One of them got delayed, um, and then you know got my recommendation to grow and became an instructor at that point. So okay, that you you mentioned um, Terry Gibson's curriculum. He was nice enough because I came out, I came out to Tulsa twice. Oh and yeah, I think the first time was in '89. And then maybe 90 or 91. But Terry was nice enough to share when, when I went full time. Right. He shared that curriculum. Yeah. Right. <laughs> with me. Now, let me tell you, there is one adjective to describe that curriculum. Extensive. Yes. It was, yeah. it, right. And, and the, fu the funny thing was, I, I, so I based my early curriculum, and this is a debt that I will always owe him. I based my early curriculum on his. Sure. Until one day, um, I, so at one point, all the staff members of one of Miami's top Taekwondo schools trained with me in my morning classes. So they trained Jun Fan Monday morning, Muay Thai Wednesday morning, and Kali Friday morning. And then they'd go back to their school and they'd teach my stuff at their Taekwondo school <laughs> yeah. and then call me and tell me how much the kids are enjoying it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then one time they shared their Taekwondo curriculum with me right. and I compared and contrasted it to our curriculum. Right. And then I forget who it was because this was 1995. We were all examining what the professional martial art business coaches were doing. Right. And I remember maybe it was John Graydon or one of those guys. And he said, whatever it is that you have as a curriculum, cut it in half. You're teaching too much. Yeah. So when I looked at their Taekwondo curriculum, which was like this. Yes. yes. Versus ours, which was like this. And I thought these guys cut this in half. Yes. But that's when that's when I, I really started whittling down. So you said that you still you still have that curriculum, but 
over the years, have you modified, adjusted, adapted anything different? Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. I still use Terry's uh, formula for how he did it. Like, okay. uh, I remember me and him and Kathy, and uh, we wrote everything that we felt like uh, someone should know uh, from white belt to black belt and we, uh, in, in Kali, and we wrote it all out. And we all three compared and things like that. And, and uh, you look at the curriculum and you go, well, these two drills are redundant. We don't need both of those. Um, you know, there's a huge gap here. Uh, you can't do this without having a little drill here before that. Because right. we did that whole thing from A to Z in Kali, whole thing A to Z in Muay Thai, in, in C-Lot, uh, and in JKD. Mm -hmm. And then broke them into levels and then broke them down into stripes and that sort of thing. And, that you know, it is, like you said, comprehensive. Yeah. So over the over the last, you know, 20 years here at my academy in, in Texas, um, you know, we, I've rewritten the curriculum several times. Uh, added stuff, taking stuff away, you know, you, you, uh, you're the, the, the blessing and the curse of, of, uh, being within Asano, uh, <laughs> is that there, uh, there is no written standard, right? There is no, you need to know these three things. And so mm -hmm. instructors are left, uh, which I think is good and bad to yeah. write their own curriculum. And, and, yeah. uh, you really end up writing a curriculum that with a material that you're good at. Mm -hmm. and you kind of avoid the curriculum you're not good at. And so, you know, it's, that's the curse. I mean, even C. Joe Lee said the hardest thing to do is protect your students from yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And so your curriculum is a direct reflection of that. So over the years, uh, you know, I've tried to write, uh, update the curriculum so that my students have a good solid base of, of fundamentals that they can perform. Yeah. And when they see Guru Dan, they're still in touch enough with what he's doing so that if he asked for, uh, the Bursalat Bua is that they can perform those or, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, conscious and brought up when you some broader who bit, you know, with disarms that they can still perform that level of material. Um, so that, you know, eventually they can become instructors under him, but at the same time, uh, still have those fundamentals. And I think you got to constantly be adapting because Guru Dan is. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so you were the first person in, I don't know how many years that I've been, I mean, I've, I've just been doing, these dialogue shows for for maybe about three months now but so outside of that you're the first person who has mentioned bursalat buas <laughs> right? right now here's the funny thing i have that stuff in one in my notebook from 1989 yes, yes. right I have that stuff. Now, I don't know where the notebook is. It might be in storage. It might have been destroyed or something. But I, I remember that stuff. Um, yeah. so, so why the, so the curriculum? Um, here's what I noticed, right? It says Filipino Kali. says Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. It says Muay Thai. And it says Indonesian Silat. So I'm going to ask you a funny question. How come there's no Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, listen, hats off to you for saying that in a, in a, in a somewhat public forum. <laughs> well, you know, so once I left Mr. Gibson's, once Mr. Gibson passed away, I, uh, we did grappling up there and it was never really my forte. It was never really something I was really great at. Uh, fortunately I had, uh, guys like Mark McFan mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and of course, Eric Paulson, uh, who were guiding me along that and kind of helping me, but uh, it would never was really my thing. And then I came down here to Texas after Mr. Gibson passed, and and of course I needed a job, so I got a job as a bouncer uh, at this uh, local nightclub. And on a, on a Saturday, good Saturday night, there'd be three thousand people in this club. Uh, yeah, it's the it was the biggest thing, unless you went to Dallas. Um, and even then a single club might not be any better, any bigger. Yeah. So because we're so, kind of isolated in this part of Texas. So I got to fight, you know, PBR rodeo clowns when they were in town and, um, local gangbangers trying, trying to sell drugs in the bathrooms and, you know, fighting over turf inside my bar and, uh, and good old boys and their brothers and cousins, you know, who, wanted to take off their cowboy uh, belts and hit me with a, with a big old belt buckle and throw chairs and beer bottles. So yeah. it didn't take long to kind of reaffirm that grappling in that environment was not really very good. 
And um, so when I kind of looked at what I felt like was uh, the, the real combative matrix for, for reality, um, the idea of voluntarily going to the ground wasn't really uh, something that I wanted to do. Now, don't get me wrong. I still believe everyone should have the fundamentals. Yeah. I really break things fighting and breaking it into pretty simple things. Yeah. It hit people hard and don't get hit hard. Okay. That so, not, yeah, it's not that you're not going to get hit. Just right. don't get hit hard where yeah. it stuns you into inactivity or breaks you. And then second is control people and don't get controlled. Right. Well, that includes grappling, clinching, standing up uh, on the ground, up against walls, over cars, over counters, on the ground. You have to be able to control another human being and not get controlled. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, if we're talking about the reality of, of conflict in the world today, you need to be able to transition to a better position and a better weapon as soon as possible if you want to survive. Yeah. And so uh, bouncing for a few years kind of reaffirmed all that. And so uh, I still think that guys need to be able to escape from the mount and that sort of stuff because you get some big redneck sitting on your chest pounding you with that that giant hand he's been hauling hay with for years that's a problem you know so uh everybody needs to be able to handle it to some degree so you you said you said um after um Sifu Terry passed away you went to Texas and you needed a job did didn't you move to Texas to open up a school I did. There was an interim there where, you know, losing Terry uh, was like losing my hero, right? So yeah. he was everything that I had wanted to be. He had a beautiful home, a, a very successful school, financially stable, had all the right credentials, all the right information, beautiful, uh, loving wife, uh, had the big fuzzy dog, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, had the relationships with the people and, and the arts that I wanted. Yeah. And so to watch him pass away um, was a big blow. And um, and so uh, I it, I really needed time to take over. So I actually moved to Florida for a summer and spent time with my pastor in Sarasota, Florida. Okay. And this was before LaVon was there. Yeah. You know, I think I remember that. Yeah. I remember it. Yeah. And uh, so, I, so I spent some time in Florida and money. I uh, What little savings I had, I blew just laying on the beach in Florida. Kind of. <laughs> Uh, hey, if you're going to do that, this is the place to do it. Yeah, it sure is. It is. And so, uh, so when I moved to, back to Wichita Falls, or up to Wichita Falls, Texas, which a friend of mine said, hey, you need to get back in the world. You need to get back to being who you are. So I, I moved to Wichita Falls with the idea of that, well, at least in the central part of the United States, I kind of have some reputation. Some people know who I am yeah. uh, because of Gibsons. And so... Yeah. Uh, and I, and I had friends there, but I really didn't want to move back to Tulsa because, you know, every restaurant was a memory, every, you know, thing. So it was a little painful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I moved to Wichita Falls, which was uh, halfway between uh, Oklahoma City and Dallas. And I okay. and, uh, had no money, so I had to kind of start things, you know. So I had to, you know, get a job. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so, that, so then tell me a little bit about the transition from, from doing the security work to opening up a school? So uh, I was uh, bouncing at the bar. Yeah. During the day, I worked in a grocery store selling meat. <laughs> and uh, I was the guy who cooked the chicken and put it on the toothpicks and handed out samples. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I did that. That job could only give me 20 hours a week. So, uh -huh. And the bouncing job gave me 20 hours a week. But none of them paid well, so I got another job that I would do after I got off at the bar at 3.34 in the morning. I would go to a local car dealership, and I would clean the car dealership and uh, sweep the floors, take out, wash the windows, take out the trash. And uh, I, 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 I hate to interrupt you, but see, that's what is, again, I'll use the adjective, that's what's so fascinating to me about the lives of my Jeet Kune Do colleagues, right? Okay, so I, so I- It wasn't very fascinating at the time, see. No, hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? Well, well what's, what's fascinating is what comes out at the other end. Yeah. You see, yeah. Of, of that, let, let's use the word struggle, right? Sure. So, so okay, so let me jump, let me jump ahead for a second, because 
I try to keep these dialogues chronological, sure. <laughs> you know, but that's not my nature. My nature is to jump all around. I right. wonder who I got that from. Yeah, really? <laughs> I think we're all like that. We all adopted that. <laughs> all right. So give us a tip for developing persistence, because obviously you had to develop that. I did. Um, I really felt like no matter what else I was doing and everything else I did, I did very well. I mean, I've never had a job where I didn't get promoted to manager or, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Never been fired. Uh, whatever I've done, I've done well, but I always felt like it wasn't really my calling. You know what I mean? Okay. Like I really felt like I was put on this earth to teach martial arts and okay. I've been doing it since I was 16. So, uh, I felt like I would do that, but every hour I did it felt agonizing, you know, like I am not doing what I, I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. And so having a real strong uh, self identity and like, this is who I am, mm -hmm. uh, I think kept me driving even when things were hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See that that's, um, that's interesting because I, I, what you're talking about there is, you know, everybody knows about Bruce Lee's definite chief aim. Yes, yes. Right? You're talking about the same thing right there. Yes. Knowing what your purpose is. Right. So, no wonder you're successful as a martial art instructor because you have that as a driving force. Right, right. You have that in your background. And so now you're able to pass that on to others. Right. You know, see, see, so, so here, that, that's why people like you are living examples of the, the success recipe. Yes, yes. But, but I think, but I think that, that some, sometimes in martial art, we're not given, we're not given the credit, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, right? It, it's like, it's like, there's a saying that, you know, martial art instructors have to be psychologists, you know, maybe, maybe even sometimes psychiatrists. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There are all these hats, right? But I got to ask you something. So you, you were born in Arkansas. You, you, you were born in, and grew up in Arkansas. That's correct. Okay. Then you moved to Oklahoma. Yes. And then you moved to Texas. Yes. Okay. Culturally, more similarities than differences or more differences than similarities? More, more similarities. Um, you know, my school that I run and the way I run it here would mm -hmm. not work in many other parts of the world. Um, Why not? My, well, my, up, my upbringing, my belief system um, that, um, that struggle and strife and, uh, uh, and difficulty are important aspects of life. And so it's okay that your kid is getting punched in the face. It's okay that you're that your kid lost today yeah. or your kid did something wrong. And so I made him do squats until he was crying. Right. And then I made him apologize and do all this stuff. So Texas gets that right. Yes. So yes. You know, it's in, it's in their ethos. It's in their belief system that this is what a man is supposed to be. This is what a responsible person is supposed to be. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we had a kid uh, not long ago. It was, it was awesome. Uh, we're running a summer camp right now. So we run a summer camp in the morning from 7.30 in the morning to 5, five in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have 110 kids in that summer camp. Okay. And uh, so uh, invariably there's going to be issues. And so a couple of kids got in a little argument and one punched the other kid. And uh, so uh, the parents come in and the dad comes in and my, my wife goes, hey, there was a little problem. The other kid didn't handle it very well and he punched your son in the face. Uh, I just wanted to let you know. And the dad goes, well, that's kind of why I'm bringing him here. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. you know, that I, I'm in the right place when they right. believe with me that those things are requirements and necessary. Yeah. So, but, um, you, you, okay, you said there, you said there's a hundred kids at, um, at summer camp. Correct. Yeah. Um, is that representative of one third of warriors ways enrollment uh, uh, kids enrollment uh yeah i'd say it's probably we have uh, 400 total 
um, you know, I think 400, it fluctuates a little over 400. Um, and so we run somewhere between overall, you know, around 450, 460 um, when we had their adults, our, our tiny little adult program. Yeah. Um, you know, but, uh, and, and then 110 of those guys will be in summer camp. And then after summer camp, they'll roll right into our after school program where we will, we will pick them up from schools and then they'll come and do martial arts after school and then their parents pick them up at five o'clock, so. Okay, all right, so, okay, so, so then, so then the, 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 the citizenry at Warrior's Way is mostly juniors yes. and then you have the strong adult program. Yes. Okay, um, so how, how did you, not even rationalize, but it, I mean, you know, there, there's been talk out there for decades that Jeet Kune Do is not for kids. Of course, yeah. Okay. yeah. So you're going to get some grief when you, when you say, well, I got a successful school and we got like 300 kids. It'll be like, well, you're not a real Jeet Kune Do school. Sure, sure. I, of course, of course. You know, everybody who's not making money says that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, uh, what I'll say is, um, at the end of it, you have your black belts, right? Your junior black belts. And mm -hmm. so you have kids come up and they're 12 years old and they get a junior black belt program. Now, how do I justify that? Well, um, my kids program is a grade school program, right? And so, um, they can graduate from grade school and go into the teens program, which would be the junior high program. Then graduate that and go to the adult program, which would be the college program, right? So, and the curriculums reflect that. You can't expect to teach um, college level algebra to grade school kids. So, in, 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 the way I look at it is if you're teaching a kid's program, if you have adults in the same class you have your kids, which I don't know that many people do these days, but if you do that, you're either asking the kids to learn adult material or the adults to learn kid material. Yes. So, so I have a kids program and you know, they do progressive indirect attack entries into trapping, into attack by combinations, into joint locks and throws. They stick spar, uh, they do projectiles. Now they stick spar with soft sticks, obviously. Yeah. But, um, um, but they kick box and, and every single one of them when they're, when they test for their little junior black belt, uh, you know, I personally spar every single kid and uh, they do three rounds. I'm the last round and I'm the hardest. So every one of them, you know, I, I knock the breath out of them. I, I kick them in the leg until they can't stand up. They've already done a three mile run, a 70 question terminology question. Mm -hmm. We have to translate 70 JKD terms into English. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to do 50 push ups, 50 leg lifts, 500 punches, 250 kicks. And demonstrate all the material, all the Lloyd Doss series, straight blast drills, all that. Yeah. And then at the end, they, they spar. And I push them to the point where their body's given up. Their hands are so tired, they can't hold them up. They can't breathe. Tears are pouring out of their face. And I'm punching them. And when they grit their teeth and punch me back in the face as hard as they can over and over, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. When their heart won't let them quit. Yeah. And uh, even though their body is, is, is not keep, able to keep up. Yeah. And so when people watch that and people see that, I'd be like, yeah, tell me that kid doesn't deserve that. Right. right. Tell me that's not JKD. Well, okay. Now tell me that you have written a book about this. Who's got time to sit down and write, man? <laughs> <laughs> I can barely remember to take a photo and put on Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> Whole events. Three day events go by, and I'm like, I didn't even take a picture. I didn't even, I didn't put that on Facebook. Nothing. All right, then you you need you need an assistant. <laughs> you need somebody to remind you everything that you just said there, right? In my opinion, what written out would rank with all of the self development and self improvement uh, books and and materials that we have out there. And that's what I was referring to earlier about the role of an excellent martial art instructor. Right, right. You know, it's all these things um, rolled, in, rolled into one. Um, Sayoc. Yep. So, where, how, and when did that come about? 
um, I was attending a Dan Inasano seminar and uh, we were doing some knife work and I was asking some questions about it. And he said, you know, really, if you want to get good at the blade work, um, you should go study with Chris Sayak. And I was like, who's that? I mean, you know, I, I, I kind of missed the era when Chris Sayak on the, was on the East Coast and kind of doing some stuff, you know. So, um, so I didn't know who he was. And he said, yeah, I, uh, on a scale from one to ten, I think his system is a ten. And I was like, whoa, that's, that's crazy, right? So I said, uh, well, what, what do you think our system would be? He goes, um, maybe seven, maybe an eight. And I, I, I couldn't believe that. I, you know, I'm like, I've never seen anything better. Right. How could there be something better? And I was asking him, what do they do? What? And he's like, like anything else, you know, when you have specialists that concentrate on a particular thing, they just do more stuff and they do it more in depth. And uh, so he gave me his number. Wow. And yeah, so I was like, OK, I mean, uh, just like every, just like everything else, Guru Dan says, go train with Master Chai. OK, you go train with Master Chai. Go train with Herman's Wonder. OK, you go train with Herman's Wonder. Right. <laughs> so he said, go train with Chris Ives. I was like, OK, I'm going to go train with Chris Ives. Yeah. And, and really, I thought it would kind of be like that. I thought I'll go learn some new things from another teacher and, you know, I add it to my curriculum and that sort of stuff. But yeah. um, it turned out to be, you know, far more than that for me personally. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I called him and said, uh, I'd like to, like to train with you. And he said, okay. Uh, let me call you back. And then he called Guru and vetted me, you know, to make sure, uh, you know, and, uh, and then called me back and says, okay, I'll, I'll, when do you want me to come down? And now keep in mind at the time, my wife and I had, I don't know, not many students. We, my wife and I lived in the school in the storeroom. So a tiny room, we lived in that room for a year and a half, me, her, and our great Dane, because we couldn't afford rent in an apartment and rent at our school. Okay. So we, we moved into the, into the commercial school and lived in a little st storeroom. So we had no money and, and we're just barely getting it, getting it going. Yeah. And, uh, but at least it was supporting us, the, her, her and I, you know? Yeah. And uh, he said, don't worry about it. I'll, you know, uh, get, get as many people as there as you can. I'll just take whatever we make at the door and, uh, and we'll get your training started. And so he came down and it was, it blew me away. I'd never uh, seen or felt that level of, of skill uh, from anyone. And, um, you know, that night, uh, my wife's laying there and she's like, they kind of scare me. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, me too. Uh, I said, but you know, I, I, he, he could literally do anything he wanted to me. You know, he could cut me at will. I mean, I was doing absolutely, it was embarrassing actually, because I had gotten all my friends and peers to be at this seminar mm -hmm. and here this guy is just treating me like I'm a, I'm a little kid, you know, just, can touch me, slap me, cut me, juggle knives, crack jokes, sheath knives, resheath knives, switch hands, throw them over my shoulder and catch them with the other hand. Just ridiculous amount of skill. And so uh, at the end of the day, I, you know, that night I was laying in bed with my wife and I'm like, first off, I never want that to happen. Anybody to ever be able to do that to me again. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and I want to be able to do it to other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that kind of started my style journey, you know, which yeah. is, uh, which has been exciting. You know? Well, see that, you see that that's another admirable thing about you because a lot of people would have gone through that and never gone back. Sure. Yeah. Right. You know, because, they, because they don't want to deal with, with that type of um, em embarrassment. Let's call it. Right? right. Okay. Did that lead to headhunter blades? Yes. Yeah, so I started training in SIOC and then with pretty, pretty early, um, we were having public events or not, not even really public events, private SIOC events, our Sama Sama our gathering where we all yeah. came together. And so Tom Kyer, uh, uh, started bringing in as, uh, as I guess, guest students to attend, uh, some, uh, some military guys. And so I, I think that it's pretty safe to say that, uh, that the, you know, that those guys were military special forces. They came in, started training with us. We all kind of clicked. And then uh, we started SOC Tactical Group, or two on Tom and, and the SOC uh, instructors started SOC Tactical Group. I was very fortunate to be in on that ground level. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started doing uh, military contracts and uh, to which we still do today. And so uh, in fact, we've been, uh, it's a full-time gig for two on Tom, uh, a lot of our guys. Uh, I did it full time. I was embedded on a team for uh, about a year and a half. Um, I was away from my wife and my school and my, my wife ran everything, ran the whole empire. And, 
and I went and played <laughs> with the with the boys. So, uh, so it was great for me. It's great for and, and tremendously influenced my martial arts training and and what I do as a person and how I teach and train now. Yeah. Uh, you know, huge influence shift. Um, but uh, Headhunters Blades was really uh, a result of us training guys in soft tactical. And, and the, the inevitable question with, was, okay, well, what should we carry? And so we'd be like, well, you know, you could carry this, but you got to fix this sheath and you got to fix the handle. And so literally we'd teach a, a military contract and we'd go in with 25, 30 knives that we made custom sheaths for, that we ground down the handle and cut this and fix that. And, yeah. and I was like, man, we, we could just make whole other knives that are based on our designs where we don't have to fix things. Yes. And so I sought out a custom knife maker and began to study under him. And about three years later, came out with a, with a product that we were comfortable with. And then it went through its whole testing phase where they all carried it around. We, SIOC instructors, carried it and tested it and used it, uh, got feedback and changes, and then eventually kind of expanded from there. So Head Under Blades is uh, the result of us trying to fill that need yeah. uh, for those kind of guys. And then eventually, my, my martial arts friends and martial arts students wanted them and you know, as we got some extra, we, you know, started selling to them and just kind of kept on going. Okay. So that clarifies it for me. You are the actual bladesmith. Yes. Yes. So, uh, there's, there's, we have, uh, there was an interim in time where we had a need and not a bladesmith. And so we sought out a guy named Daniel Winkler. Uh, Daniel Winkler is famous for making the knives and the tomahawks for the movie, The Last of Mohicans. Okay. Um, world-class bladesmith, amazing guy. Yeah. And so uh, he kind of made blades for us until myself and a guy named Tuan Carl Lachenza, um got up to speed. And so, um, you know, uh, we needed to hone the actual mechanics of making knives. Mm -hmm. Now we know what feels right and we know what the designs are from all the years of training and application, but, um, you know, I needed to know how this grinder makes this grind and how do you attach these handles and which steel is best and all that stuff. And uh, so, uh, so now we all work together, uh, myself, Carla, Juan Carla Chenza and Daniel Winkler, we all work together uh, to Amazing. produce the blades for Sia Kali and Chenza Kali. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I was doing the research to, to, to talk to you, I, it dawned on me that it's warriors – Huh? You did research? That's so did. Okay. <laughs> You're such a professional. <laughs> All right. It, it dawned on me, warrior's way is another way of saying the way of the warrior. Yes. I'm wondering if that, so that's a 1982 BBC documentary. Yes, yes. Did, it, it, is there a connection there? Did that play a role in naming your school? No, not really. Um... But, you know, I've kind of always had the idea that, that martial arts really is based in war, right? So that's where I get the phrase, martial comes before art, right? Yes. I use that a lot, right? So yes. you can be artistic as you want. If those guys want your stuff, they just come over and stomp a mud hole in you and take your shit. So, uh, so you have to be able to defend yourself, right? You, yes. you have to, martial has to be the primary element to be able to survive. Then once a, once a culture and a people and a tribe and a family have, have stability and security, then they have the freedom of self-expression through artistic means. Mm -hmm. So I really am a big believer that you need to be able to, that, that still needs to be a, a part of what we're teaching. Um, if not, and, and I know a lot of people do say that they are, but we, we know for a fact that they have a hard time with that when it translates to real confrontation. Yeah. In the classroom, putting on gloves and going at it, they do okay. But when we get to the street, sometimes there's a huge, there's a huge void there. And so uh, um, I think that we can, it, it's very common in the martial arts to build a false sense of confidence in students. You know, and they go, I think I can handle it. And then they get out there and they get their butt handed to them and, and they don't really understand why. Yeah. And uh, so I think that m martial comes before art, you know, yeah. so. So what, what, what would be one of the bridges in the approach that you use that would connect that real world um, situation to what you're doing in class? Yeah. So 
So I, I still want to have the high level of martial arts uh, capability because I still think that those drills and all the stuff that Guru Nasano is teaching, I think that's all incredibly relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not so nearsighted to, to believe that a drill is supposed to be combatively app app a combative application. You know, we all know that there's certain things that you're like, yeah, no, I would never fight like that. That's just builds an attribute in me to be able to fight. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you can get your head around that uh, and get rid of the, the, the silliness that people argue about, then we can still see that there's validity in the whole curriculum. Um, and then my training with SIOC and training, uh, you know, as a contractor with military, if I look at those th sort of things, there are factors in, that in real fights that martial arts do not address. So okay. one is unequal initiative. It's as simple as that. We take the Sayak Kali principle of unequal initiative, right? If we, if we said, okay, we're going to spar, me and you are going to spar. And you go over and you unzip your gear bag and you get your boxing gloves out and you're lacing up and you put your mouthpiece in. And I hit you in the back of the head right there and start elbowing you and throw you to the ground and jump. I win that sparring match. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. an enormous amount of street fights start exactly like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In fact, the guy doesn't even realize, one guy doesn't realize he's in a fight yet. The other guy already knows. Yeah. He's just waiting for the right angle and the right time. So this guy's waiting for somebody to say go. This guy already said go in his head. He's just trying to get the right distance in the right place, right? <laughs> but nobody can pra nobody practices that in the martial arts school because that's unfair. That's unsportsmanlike. That's, you know, no, you wait till the bell rings. You wait till the instructor says go. Yeah. And so how do martial arts train that? How do they train unequal initiative, right? Um, do they even realize that's an issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh and then force multipliers. We're talking about the reality of the world. You know, uh, you know, it, it's great to be bigger and stronger and faster and, you know, have, you know, uh, violence of action and all that stuff that, that people like the, those phrases people like to throw around. Mm -hmm. but, the rea but the reality is, is that I'm one rolled ankle from losing an enormous amount of attributes, right? I'm one bad Mexican meal from losing <laughs> of attributes, right? So... You know, I've been in fights uh, where uh, I had a guy in plum, and I'm about to knee him into oblivion, and somebody else tackles both of us, and the very first thing hits, hits the ground, the concrete that we're on is my elbow, right? And so now my left elbow, my left arm is shot, right? So now I'm fighting one-handed. I'm in pain. I'm mentally distracted. So, it, you know, a ton of fights, people get their pinky broken, their thumb jammed right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you know you're in a fight because you got bang, and you're like, Right. Oh, and now you know, oh, that's the go bell, yeah. right? And so, but now I'm mentally and physically a little bit down. Yeah. So um, when we look at our attributes, uh, yes, we absolutely want to be as healthy as we can for longevity, which, you know, using Guru Dan is a perfect example of that. Um, you know, we want to be as healthy as we can so we can live long, ha happy lives and be uh, fruitful and productive for our families and loved ones. Yeah. And so we increase our quality of life. And we want to also be the biggest, strongest, meanest beast on the battlefield, right? <laughs> so, but it doesn't take much. You know, you fight one or two guys and now you're so winded, right? You mm -hmm. spent your adrenaline, if you got an adrenaline dump, you spent your adrenaline and now you're in parasympathetic backlash. You can barely stand up um, and you still have two more guys you got to deal with, right? So, um, so I believe that weapons and the transition to weapons is a real critical thing when it comes to the reality of violence in today's world. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna tell you my my story because all three elements are combined: unequal initiative, force multiplier, and uh, parasympathetic backlash. I was in New York at a New Breed seminar with Inasano, and he calls me up to demonstrate with Nick Sekoulis. Yes. So we're doing double stick, right? Right. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, R Nick goes into a second gear. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and I'm like, holy crap, he's going to kill me. <laughs> All right? I mean, I go, oh, man. So this is what the kids are capable of. <laughs> so it was it was it, i mean it really changed my mindset right, right. it was force multiplied because he just wailed 
Yes. <laughs> right. And it was unequal initiative. Right. He was, he was, he got that next gear faster than you did. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that, you know, yeah. that little experience with Nick made me a believer in, in everything that the Sioc tribe puts out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nick, will, Nick will love it that you called him one of the kids, uh, by the way. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because, you know, because there, there, there's, there's us guys who came in, in in the early to mid-80s. Yes, yes. And then there are the guys who came about, like, in the mid-90s, like a decade after we did. What I love about them is that when it came to the idea or the prospect of teaching martial art professionally, they're fearless. Yes. It did not go through the all... You know, I don't know if this happened to you, but I went through the phase where whatever it is that the Taekwondo schools are doing, you don't want to do that. Sure, sure. And I swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. Right. Until the day I saw the Taekwondo guy with his brand new Mercedes. <laughs> you know, right. and I had the Rustin Honda Accord and I thought, something's not right. Right, something's not right with this picture. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and if you will, go, we go back to Sayak. You know, Tuan Sayak was the same thing. He was like, hey, you should just go open a Taekwondo school, hire a Taekwondo guy, have him teach on the other side of town, and be your competition. And really, you own both schools. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's like, wow, that's uh, the that's way to do it. But well, Yeah, I mean, because, you know what I, I found out? When, well, I mean, when, when I was still running my school, I found out that Staples, the office supply company, yeah. they opened up their own competition. Quill is there is there is a staples company yeah but yeah. they're promoted as being competition for them you yeah. know yeah so yeah so um okay well listen i don't want to take up too much more of your time this was this was even more fun than i thought it would be <laughs> you, you thought know? it was very boring no no i didn't <laughs> no it, no i said it was more fun right <laughs> no i didn't I, I mean it's you know you and i had we haven't spoken in a while i haven't seen right. you in a while and right. you know sometimes i'm i'm not sure but you know what it's like it's like when i go up to baltimore if i haven't seen my family in a month right, right in three months you're right there immediately right. and yes. i find that with most people in the jkd clan it's that way we right. may not have seen each other and so that's one of the reasons why i want to keep doing this program yes because you know, you all you guys out there, you're you're my heroes, you're my role models. Even if I'm senior or junior to you or whatever, I th I think that yes, on the physical level, there's we can all learn from each other. But yeah. I think that mentally and emotionally and and even professionally, there's even yeah. more for us to learn from each other. And so you know, I kind of I I kind of consider it my and I have fun talking with you guys. <laughs> you know, so then I thought, well, why, why, why be selfish? Why don't I just put it in a public forum? Right, sure. Everybody can see the greatness that we have in the Jeet Kune Do clan. And you, my friend, are a perfect example of that Jeet Kune Do greatest. So I want to thank you for, uh, for, you know, taking the time out on this Friday evening. Well, thank you very much for having me. I, I, uh, I'm, I, I felt very honored when you asked me to be on your show. So I was like, wow, of course, yeah, of course I'd be happy to be on your show. Yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate it. All right, well, okay, and we'll yeah. do it again. This is just, this is just uh, part one. Okay, okay, all right, all right. I'll okay. hold you to that. All right, Harley, take care, have a good one. Take care, sir, thank you, have a great weekend. Thanks all again right. for everything. Bye.